Mate 40 Pro. It's the most powerful phone they've made by an absolute landslide, but it's also super confusing. Okay, the unboxing experience hasn't really shifted too much from standard Huawei fare, but you will notice this new circular ring on the front. That'll make more sense in a minute. You've got the smartphone on top, you've got an insert with a SIM ejector tool and a clear case. Oh, look at the size of that camera cutout. There's a USB-C cable, a pair of earpods but not earpods, and this is interesting, a 66 watt charger, a single watt more powerful than Oppo and OnePlus's 65. Hmm. Now, when I picked the phone up for the first time, I had two immediate observations. One, good lord it's big. It's thankfully a little shorter and narrower than the Note 20 Ultra, but this is a chunky boy. We haven't been given exact specifications yet, but it's definitely heavier. The second thing though, is that I absolutely love the finish. Dare I say that for me, this might just be the prettiest phone I've ever used. To put it into Samsung terms, it takes the kind of crazy colours of the Galaxy Note 10 and fuses it with the more sophisticated matte finish of the Note 20 Ultra. When I first got it, I was just sat here like, okay, I can see red, blue, oh, there's purple, there's a bit of green, it's everything. And that would also kind of explain why for the Mate 40 Pro overseas, you only get two models, black and this. This is all the colours, and just generally it's a nice, smooth feeling phone. There's not a single sharp edge to be found on it, anywhere. And cool little red power button too. Also, just when you thought you'd seen every possible way to design a smartphone camera module, here's another one. They call it the space ring. I call it the camera donut. But you can kind of see where they're coming from, it's got a very alien, UFO type aesthetic. I'm still not sure if I think it looks futuristic. I can't help but feel like flip it upside down and this is an iPod scroll wheel. But there is a major perk of having a camera ring this wide and central, and that's the fact that it prevents the phone wobbling. Oh, and if you are enjoying the video by the way, a sub to the channel would be cherished. I'm kind of running out of words. There is just as much action happening on the front. You're looking at a 6.76 inch OLED Horizon display with a resolution that sits somewhere in between Full HD and Quad HD. It's a good screen, it's got a 90Hz refresh rate, really quite stellar colours, but most notably this 88 degree curvature. It's so steep that from the front you can't really see the sides. It looks like the display just falls off the edges and that these buttons are actually just mounted on the screen. For me, this is an aesthetic positive but at the same time it's kind of a practicality negative because it doesn't matter which angle you look at the screen from, some part of it will look distorted. You look from the sides and the front looks off. You look from the front, the sides look off. You have this green tint, a, a noticeable discoloration. Plus, if you just compare this to the Mate 30 Pro from last year, which had this nice uniform bezel that kind of followed the display around the sides, the bezel here kind of tries to cut the corner a bit. It doesn't look as good. And you have got this massive camera hole punch too. But I will say on that note that what's in it is worth the visual distraction. Anyways, there's a bit of a, an elephant in the room. You probably don't need telling that Huawei, right now as a company, is in a bit of a pickle. Their phones don't have Google services, no Google Maps, no Google Play Store. Huawei can't sell in the US at all. It's not good news. And what makes it so much more of a shame is that I've been using this Huawei Mate 40 Pro for a few days now and there's just some really cool stuff here. I don't know if you remember this, but last year with the Mate 30 Pro, Huawei fixed auto-rotate. Most phones have always just had a standard feature where if you're holding a phone in portrait, your content is displayed in portrait. If you're holding it in landscape, the content is landscape. But that's not ideal because every now and again, you might want to be able to lie down, but keep your content still in portrait orientation. So Huawei started using the face scanner on their phones to see which way your face was and just always match it. Why am I telling you this? Well, it's because this year, I would say that Huawei has taken that further and they fixed always on displays. Most phones nowadays have an option to keep this low power consumption screen on at all times, just to keep you posted with the time and notifications. But if we're always managing to use the face scanner to now be able to only show you the screen when you look at the phone. They're calling it eyes on display. And I couldn't believe how well it works. Like the first time I tried it, I remember I just burst into this massive grin because it's cool tech and it's not a gimmick. The phone's running MUI 11 based on Android 10 and I really like how it handles guest accounts. You just pull down, tap here, 
And that's it. You can just hand the phone to someone else without worrying that they're going to look through your stuff. And this multi-window mode is... It's one of the few things that's made me really miss using an Android as my main phone. We've got both a 3D face scanner and an in-display fingerprint scanner, so you could choose how to unlock your phone. And the battery life is fantastic. The capacity is 4,400 milliamp hours, which is about average for today's day and age, but the software is so aggressive on apps running in the background that for the last two full days I've been using it, I'm finishing the day on like 35% left. And finally, as you probably expected, Huawei's brought their A-game to the camera. This is a, a meaty setup. Its main camera completely nukes the iPhone 12 Pro in most situations. It's got that nice big sensor to get a crispy foreground-background separation. The front camera still isn't as natural looking as I'd like it to be, but it's very detailed, almost too detailed. And with this phone, part of the reason we've got that chunky hole punch is that there's also an ultra-wide front camera. And it's not an afterthought like you might expect it to be. This is a really high-quality, super detailed lens. Plus. 5 times optical zoom, which means you can get crisp shots all the way up to 10, sometimes 15 times magnification. In fact, weirdly, the only thing that I wasn't really impressed by was the phone's night mode. And I didn't expect to be saying that, because a couple of years ago, Huawei was so far ahead of the competition at taking photos in the dark, it was funny. And this phone's still great at it, but I just think it's one of those cases where the competition's caught up. But yeah, you get the idea. I mean, there is a lot to like here. However, the Mate 40 Pro is super confusing. It's got a pretty standard 8 gigabytes of RAM, a fairly generous 256 gigs of storage. But also, this is the first phone in the world to be powered by the new Kirin 9000 chip. And that in itself is the first chip that is both 5 nanometer and has a 5G modem baked inside of it for better efficiency. So that's great, right? I ran a couple of benchmarks. The gaming performance is coming out at like 60% better than last year. That's huge. And AI performance, something like three times greater. Even just when playing games, this phone can play Standoff 2 on maximum settings with eight times anti-aliasing and 16 times anisotropic filtering at an uninterrupted 60 FPS. For those of you who didn't get that, it's fast. But see, Huawei's chipset business is in trouble. I mentioned earlier that because of the US ban, from this point on, unless something changes, they're probably not going to be able to make any more flagship chips. So it sounds like what Huawei's done is stockpiled. They produced as many of these Kirin 9000s as they could before the restrictions came in. Current estimates say they've got about 8 to 10 million chips, which might sound like a lot, but when you think about the scale of a company like Huawei, it's not. Huawei sold 12 million Mate 30 Pros within a few months last year. So what are they going to do here? Honestly, I don't know. That is the golden question. Maybe there's a bigger plan. Maybe they're waiting to tell people. We should wait and see what Huawei has to say before drawing conclusions. But the way I see this happening is either they severely restrict the countries they're selling it in to focus on their core markets, or they just have really limited stock. Now that doesn't sound too bad, but it's not just the Mate 40 Pro that we've got to worry about. What about the next phone? Because as far as we can see right now, if Huawei can't build flagship chips in the future, they can't make flagship phones in the future. They're always pumping millions of dollars into trying to build their own app ecosystem. And it is super impressive that their app gallery has something like 360% year-on-year growth. They've got Petal Search to find new applications that aren't on their store. Great. They're even building their own Huawei-produced Maps application. That's incredible. But it's just that if this is the last flagship that Huawei can sell to the West, how can this ecosystem actually sustain itself? How does Huawei actually get new users onto it? Like, even if I buy a Mate 40 Pro now and enter the Huawei ecosystem, if there's not going to be a Mate 60 Pro in two years' time when I want to upgrade from that, then surely I'm just going to leave the ecosystem. They'd have to start buying chips from other companies. They've already applied for a license to work with Qualcomm, but that seems unlikely. MediaTek? Maybe? But if Huawei works with MediaTek and starts using MediaTek chips, their phones are going to be well behind in performance. Probably the best example of how I feel about this phone is my experience with the speakers. This phone has a cracking set of dual speakers. Audio comes out the bottom and the top at the same time, and there's so much sound separation, it wraps around you. But then I remembered I can't enjoy them on YouTube, which would be kind of my default go-to, because this phone doesn't have Google Apps. So I went to the app gallery to try and find an app that could stream the video I wanted in full quality. The first one just says not available yet. The rest weren't what I was looking for, so then I went to Huawei's own video app, and it just says content not available. I was really hoping that this ecosystem would mature faster than it has done. So yeah, exceptional phone, super exciting hardware, really unfortunate situation. If you enjoyed this video, do consider subscribing, um, that would be fantastic. 